on today's World Insight with Tian Wei. Iran shoots down a U.S. drone while the White House ramps up the rhetoric. Is diplomacy still on the table? And the pursuit of beauty in costume and set design. The Oscar-winning art director of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Tim Mia, shares his keys to success. It's not just happiness. It's something to to touch your heart and then make you feel strong. And welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live on CGTN. Iran and the United States are now locked in a tense standoff as Tehran's telecom minister dismisses reports that the Pentagon launched a cyber attack against Iranian targets. The minister says no successful attack has been carried out by the Americans, although it is not from lack of trying. The U.S., however, according to the Washington Post, they said the U.S. launched the attack on Thursday with the intention of disabling Iran's missile system. They later reported on Saturday that it was a success. Tensions between Iran and the United States have intensified after a U.S. drone was shot down by the Iranian forces. Many in the Persian Gulf region and the world are now concerned that the standoff could escalate into a major confrontation. Here are the latest updates. In my opinion, of course, amid mounting tensions between the U.S. and Iran, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo seeks to build a global coalition against Tehran. He is traveling to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to discuss the issue with the two U.S. allies. The trip comes after President Donald Trump called off a planned retaliatory military strike in response to the downing of a U.S. drone by Iran. The president tweeted on Friday that the response would not have been proportionate. With the strike called off, reports came in of the Pentagon secretly launching cyber attacks against Iranian missile control system. The attacks were reported as having successfully disabled Iranian computer systems, a claim denied by Iran's telecoms minister. On Sunday, Iran's foreign minister Mohammad Javad Zarif accused the U.S. of sending spy drones to the region, saying one such aircraft had also encroached his country's airspace in May. Pompeo dismissed it as childlike. On the same day, Iran's deputy foreign minister Abbas Arakchi said Tehran's decision to decrease commitment to the nuclear deal is irreversible, ignoring Trump's threat of major additional sanctions to come on Monday. For U.S.-Iran tensions in Washington, we have Michael O'Hallon, senior fellow from the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence, director of the research for foreign policy at Brookings Institution. Good to see you, sir. In Tehran, Iran, joining us. Nice to be with you. Ganbar Nadari, political analyst and columnist with Keihan International Newspaper. In our Beijing studio here in China, Zhou Rong, senior fellow from the Chongyang Institute for financial studies of Renmin University, certainly uh, one who knows Iran very well. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. want to ask a very direct question, Mr. O'Hanlon. How big a danger is that a military conflict between the United States and Iran? It's there because Iran, as you know, is under extreme economic pressure, and it does not have a lot of ways of pushing back except for the targeted use of violence. The good news, if there is any good news, is that so far Iran has been fairly careful not to kill people as it's carried out these attacks. And the good news is that President Trump, as you know, withheld retaliation, at least for now. So uh, both sides are showing a certain amount of restraint, but in a context of a very, very difficult showdown that has no obvious end in sight. So I think we're still living on pins and needles and the chances of some kind of conflict are still uh, higher than I would like. Pins and needles, is that also your analysis, Mr. Nadari, from Iran? Well, that's exactly what people want here, the government want, wants here. We don't want war, we don't want confrontation. All we want is some kind of, you know, respect 
and understanding because Iran has been under this intense situation for the past 40 years. It just escalated now. So, so we are pretty much used to this kind of confrontation with the United States. But you're asking me, if you're asking me or the people of this country, we don't want that. Enough is enough. They should all call it quits. We want some kind of understanding and dialogue between all these two governments for the simple fact that this is no longer uh, just about them. The thi uh, things have gotten, uh, have gotten out of control. The situation is extremely dangerous and mm. we need some adults in the room in order to bring both sides to the negotiating tables. Right. Well, both of you have mentioned a sense of caution from the U.S. part and also from the Iranian part, though the reasons could be very different for two sides. Mr. Ohana, if I could come back to you before I bring in the Chinese guest. Uh, Mr. Ohana, uh, there are divisions, no doubt about it, inside the White House and also in the administration. How do you see the domestic uh, uh, divisions existing there likely to have an impact on the ultimate direction of where things are going? besides what the Iranians are doing, according to Washington's side? Well, I don't think there's that much political pressure, because Democrats tend to be, on balance, a little more in favor of diplomacy with Iran, as you know, going back to President Obama's 2015 nuclear deal. And so most Democrats are uh, willing to see President Trump back off from an immediate military retaliation. So I think the real pressure is, as you say, inside the administration. The debate with uh, Mr. Pompeo and Mr. Bolton as the hawks, perhaps, on the one side, and then perhaps uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dunford, and President Trump himself inclined towards more restraint. Of course, President Trump gets to make the decision, ultimately. And I, you know, I'm not a big supporter of President Trump overall, but I am glad that he s seems to show restraint when it comes to pulling the trigger in a mm -hmm. situation like this. So I hope that can continue. If there's anyone that knows Iran well, uh, according to his track record, uh, certainly President Carter could be one with a lot of reference looking at his past record. Mr. O'Hannon, we understand that, that President Carter, during the Sunday uh, service in, the, in his local church, he even praised the President Trump for going into military conflict with Iran. But the question really is, with the presidential election uh, upcoming, while well, President Trump running for re-election, how much will praise from the other side, the other party in other words, uh, be able to help him to uh, shift his way uh, to victory? Well, as you know, President Carter is a very distinguished uh, gentleman and he's done amazing things for people around the world since he was president, but he's also a very old man who does not really speak for the mainstream of the Democratic Party at this mm. point. He's almost sort of like a Nelson Mandela figure in the United States now. He's, he's not really a major partisan actor. People admire him for his humanitarian work, uh, for his sheer resilience, and for his personal ethics. But I don't think that he's a major player in that kind of a political uh, face-off in the way that you mentioned for the 2020 campaign. I see. And Mr. Nadari from Iran, from the other perspective, how is Tehran interpreting the division in Washington about what approach to take toward Iran at this point? Meanwhile, how should we understand the exercise of caution from the Iranian side as well, besides what you have just said, that, you know, everybody, nobody wants to have a war, but certainly we also see provocations from Iranian side from time to time, according to media reports at least. So, Mr. Nadari, how should we understand this? Well, unfortunately, we have seen some provocations on the part of the Iranian side, which is unfortunate, as I told you, regrettable. I think we shouldn't repeat this kind of uh, confrontation with the United States because it is not worth it. If we want dialogue and, and, and if we want the sanctions regime to be lifted, we have no option but to de-escalate and at the same time uh, 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 keep the door, door uh, of negotiations open. So, so that, that, that's the end of it. That, that, that's the only way forward for Iran because the, the country cannot take 
take any more war with the United States or its allies in the region. We have already paid a huge price through sanctions and, and the fact that uh, uh, wars have been going on for a couple of years in Iraq and Syria and of course Yemen. So last thing in our minds is to have another uh, war in the, in the volatile region of Middle East. And let's not forget the fact that this is going to destabilize the global energy market. Mm. And that's the only way that we can make money. And if this market is destabilized, we are not going to win. We are, not, we are going to lose big time. That's why I think uh, Iran has no other option but, but to give the Trump administration the benefit of the doubt and, and give peace a chance. That's the, uh, that's the only way forward. Mm. Mr. Joe, you've been listening very attentively yeah. to your colleagues from the U.S. and Iranian side. Mr. Yeah. Joe, now, uh, President Trump has been calling out over the past few hours China and some of the other countries to protect uh, their own ships, in his own words, in the Hormuz uh, region. So how should we, Hormuz Strait region, how should we understand the role that the U.S. is playing and the interpretation of this warning. How is China looking at the situation as one of the biggest the importer of Iranian oil, while at the same time uh, not necessarily agree with the United States when the last war in Iraq took place? I think uh, we can just put it in several ways. For number one, the United States have to learn some lessons uh, from Iraqi war, which uh, there are some rumors, some uh, disinformation about the mass dis destructive uh, weapons uh, stored in Iraq. And right now, Iran is very different with uh, more than 80 million of population. Iran is much, much more stronger than I Iraq. I'm very happy that President uh, uh, <coughs> Trump uh, for the last 10 minutes, just call back the airstrike against uh, Iran, and uh, also that everybody feel relief. I'm sure that both China, India, South Korea, and Japan are the, what do we say, the vital interest uh, of Iran's uh, oil import. So for anything that is uh, some of the uh, uh, Indian Navy ships has already go just close to the uh, gang close to the Hormuz uh, Strait, and also China may also think that we need some uh, uh, ships to go there close by to show that our protection spirit. But anyway, we need de-escalation, not escalation. Well, uh, while you're talking about this, things be could become quite. Uh, complicated if uh, countries of interest go into the region. As we know, there could be accidents, could be this possibility and that possibility happen at any moment uh, in a local, very small area. Uh, Mr. O'Hanlon, how do you see uh, what uh, President Trump has been doing, warning others to take care of their ships, while at the same time, Secretary of State Pompeo trying to build what he called a coalition in a way uh, against uh, Iran. Uh, do we see division once again? Well, it's fascinating to observe this dynamic. This is President Trump's uh, long-standing view, of course, that other countries should do more for their own and for collective defense. And it has some merit, clearly. For example, our NATO allies uh, could still do a lot more they spend about one and a half percent of their GDP each on their military. But as you know, in the case of the U.S.-China uh, military relationship, the United States does not always want China to do more. In fact, there are a lot of Americans who would be uh, concerned if all of a sudden Chinese warships started showing up in the Persian Gulf, mm. which historically has been more a place of American preeminence. So that sword cuts both ways. And uh, this may actually not be as popular of a move if President Trump were actually to get China uh, to defend ships that were headed for China using Chinese naval vessels. That would not be universally welcomed at the Pentagon or the State Department. Mm. Mr. Joe. I'm not saying that China will just uh, send some special Navy ships. I'm saying that maybe some of the raccoon uh, ships which if there are some of the angels and the killings, so China should just rescue some of the shipmen or something like that. Mm. We are not, we're just going there to some humanitarian means, not necessarily just to show our muscles like United States.
Mm, interesting. Uh, well, you see already, Mr. Nadari, uh, countries besides the United States and Iran are already on high alert about the latest situation, not to mention Iran itself. Uh, now, we understand there were reports about Iran uh, once again working on its nuclear program, a nuclear weapon-related program, and there are certainly concerns about that, and that could provide excuses for those who advocate military actions toward Iran. Now, we do not know exactly what is going on because sometimes media reports could also be misinformation without confirmation. So, Mr. Nadari, can you help us understand more about the logic behind the strategies of the current administration now in Iran about the latest situation? Well, the Iranian government is desperate because they promised that if we signed the nuclear deal, we, uh, we, uh, all sanctions would be lifted. It mm. didn't happen. Now they are under immense pressure by the hardliners here, and they have to do something about it because the president refuses to be a lame duck president. I'm talking about Rouhani. So they are somehow trying to backtrack on Iran's commitments within the confines of the nuclear deal. Let's not forget the fact that Iran is committed to the nuclear deal. Iran is not going to walk out of the deal despite the U.S. withdrawal. But now they are trying to put some pressure on the European side or the European signatories to the deal because they have failed to help Iran see the economic benefits of this important international agreement that was, by the way, ratified by the UN Security Council. So they are somehow directing the, their pressure on, on the European signatories. Mm. Uh, that's why we, we, uh, they have backtracked and they are, they are enriching uh, uh, uranium uh, beyond their commitments. And that's why this way they are trying to send a signal to, to the European side that, look, we can do things that you, you might regret it. So help us see the economic benefits and we are going to stop all this nonsense together because we don't want war, uh, okay. we don't want nuclear weapons and, and uh, uh, otherwise why on earth did we, uh, would have we signed the nuclear deal in the first place? So it's, it's, it's a political game. Yeah, uh, Mr. O'Hannon, what Mr. Nadari said really makes sense because of uh, the recent years of history regarding the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA and things related to that. But the question really is, uh, Mr. Rohani, if I could, uh, uh, whether the whole debate is going to be changed as a result of the U.S. claiming that Iranians shot down drones of the United States in uh, what the U.S. consider as the public place. However, the Iranians said it's within its own territory. That is a question, isn't it? That People will move the attention from the JCPOA withdrawal of the United States by this current administration to uh, let's try to avoid a war. So if that were the case, has the administration succeeded in shifting the goalpost in a way, examining the Iranian issue? Well, I think President Trump was smart not to strike last week mm. because in this situation, as you know, the world sees Washington as having created the immediate crisis because we withdrew from the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and then we insisted that the world community apply maximum economic pressure against Iran, which I think is the immediate catalyst towards the Iranian use of violence against shipping in the broader Persian Gulf. I'm not trying to defend Iran's role, but I am explaining the sequence of mm -hmm. events, which means that, of course, many people in the world do blame the United States. And therefore, I believe it's smart for President Trump to try to show that in some ways he is trying to be reasonable and restrained. But ultimately, we need a way out of this broader showdown between Iran and the United States. It's going to require some new kind of deal that mm -hmm. goes over a longer period of time on nuclear restrictions and then tries to in some way tamp down the strategic competition in places like Syria and Yemen and Iraq where Iran has been using violence for a long time as well as with Hezbollah in Lebanon and against Israel. Iran has been a, uh, a more revolutionary actor in the broader Middle East and done a lot of covert activity that right. this administration in Washington has decided it must oppose. Mm -hmm. So we need some kind of a way to talk about that with Iran, and, and therefore I do support some kind of diplomacy, but it's going to be very hard. 
Mr. Nadri, of course, there were uh, obvious accusations in the statement made by Mr. Nohan, and so it's only fair that I'd like you to respond to that, first of all. And secondly, how do you see uh, the next stage of interactions, the nature of it, between Tehran and Washington, Mr. Nadri? With all due respect to your distinguished guest, let's uh, imagine for a moment that everything he said uh, is correct. I agree that what he said about Iran's role in the region is, uh, is right. But, but what next? The question is not what happened yesterday. The question is what's going to happen tomorrow, which is going to destroy the whole region. And that, 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 that's going to be a war between Iran and the United States. We are here to prevent that kind of uh, disaster. And, and the only way to do that is to, 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 to show some kind of mutual respect to sit down and act like two adults. That's all we want from the United States. We don't okay. want much. We haven't violated the nuclear deal. It's the U.S. that violated the, the, the deal. Yes. Just get back to the nuclear deal. Just sit down at the negotiating table, lift the sanction, and stop threatening us militarily, and you will see that you, you will have a perfect partner in the name of Iran in the Middle East when it comes to restoring peace and st stability okay. across the whole region. We don't expect much from, the, from Washington. All we want is just to listen to us and, 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 and uh, treat us as an equal partner when it comes to regional issues. Well, that's going to be difficult, isn't it, for the current administration, Mr. O'Hanlon, very briefly? Well, very briefly, I do not support everything about the Trump policy. But Iran already had a chance to show restraint after the 2015 deal. That's the same year that Iran escalated its support for Houthi rebels in Yemen. Iran had an opportunity to show restraint in regard to how it uh, arms and trains Hezbollah. And by the way, there are estimated of 1,000 Americans who have been killed in the broader Middle East by Iran or its weapons since 1983, right. going back to the Lebanon attacks in Beirut. So Iran has been a very violent actor. It's got to figure out a way to ratchet back okay. its violence in the broader Middle We've East. Got a lot of accusations going on between the two sides. Mr. Joe, your time to talk. I think that I don't really uh, quite agree to say that the Iranian government is a, uh, desperate. I think the Iranian government is still very calm. I think the right thing is uh, let's go back to the negotiation table, but it's unreasonable just to, go to discuss, to rediscuss the deal again, because for the f it is the uh, United States who violate that kind of deal first, and also that is uh, the escalation which can trigger the war. I don't think the war is uh, so President Trump-like. But uh, then, to, Mr. Zhou, when you talk about going back to the negotiation table, going back to the negotiation table but without the previous deal, so what kind of deal are we say, talking about? Can Go we ahead. say that it's uh, at least, uh, uh, for the United States, you have at least uh, not necessarily leap, but also suspension of the current uh, maximum pressure, at least uh, some of the sanctions against Iran. If you do something like that, that can make uh, quite pleasant atmosphere for renegotiation for something. Well, President Trump was already hinting about uh, negotiating or talking at least to Mr. O'Hanlon. Could that, could that happen? But uh, yes. M Mr. O'Hanlon, please. <laughs> yeah, because coming from the U.S. side probably has a better judgment than all of us outside. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. O'Hanlon. Well, well I, I'm not sure I do have a better idea because President <laughs> Trump is difficult to, to read. But I think, there is the I think there is the possibility of negotiations, and I think they would have to do two main things, in addition to ultimately lifting some of the economic pressure, mm -hmm. as your other guests have mentioned. One, there probably would need to be some kind of an extension of the time limits in the nuclear deal. So far, Iran has said it would not consider that, but any kind of other non-proliferation treaty around the world has always been of long-term duration. Right. Secondly, we need to figure out some way for every, everyone to de-escalate the violence in Yemen and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. And if we can figure out some way to talk about that, there is hope. But that will be very hard. But that sounds like a very long journey. Uh, if both, all sides will be able to achieve that, Mr. Nagari. It is possible, but as you just mentioned, it is going to take a long time. I think the first thing we need is to build or rebuild trust, mutual trust between these two rivals in the region. If that happens, then we will see that they are going to come to some kind of terms with each other. As your distinguished guest in Beijing made it absolutely clear, lift the sanctions regime at least for, for, for a short period of time yeah. in order to, to, to defeat the hardliners here in the Iranian capital, because mm -hmm. that's the only excuse they have in order not 
not to sit down and talk to the United States. I think right. the U.S. has to lift parts of the sanctions for the time being in order to get us back to the negotiating table. Now, gentlemen, all of your insights are extremely exciting, but there's one thing we really need to touch on, that the Iranian issue is not just the Iranian issue itself, and the relations between Iran and Washington is not this bilateral relation alone, but rather it's a bigger region that we're talking about. All of you touch on that. Let's go a little bit detail with the remaining three minutes we have. Uh, Mr. Joe, now, yeah. we understand the U.S. already uh, put in more than a thousand to, uh, more soldiers into the Middle East. Uh, however, earlier we also see the debates going on in the current administration about what approach to take in the greater Middle East. Uh, who is going to be in charge? What roadmap? Uh, with all of those questions in the air, Mr. Joe, how is Iranian issue likely to shape or be shaped by the bigger picture, Mr. Joe? I, th I don't really think uh, one thousand uh, surge of the American soldiers can just escalate uh, the current no. situation. I don't really think so. I think that currently the most important thing is uh, to use some of the second and uh, some secret channels between the United States and uh, Iran for Oman, for Iraq, for a couple of cases. They should have the engagement uh, very frequently mm -hmm. in order not to just uh, misunderstand each other, to de-escalate uh, such a, a, t a tight situation. I don't really think, uh, uh, what do we say, deal is dead. Deal is still on lifeline, and Iran has not lost love, and, uh, and there's uh, no love loss in Iran and in Europe. Okay, and uh, Mr. Nagari, your thought here, uh, whether there is still time, whether there is still opportunity. Absolutely. We, we, we haven't, you know, tried each and every direction yet. I think we have to get back to the negotiating tables. And as, as you just mentioned, the current confrontation is illegal under international law. The two sides have to come to their senses and de-escalate because this is not just about them. It is about international peace and security. So they better make up their minds and get back to the negotiating tables before things get out of hand and they won't be able to control it. But, you know, you haven't answered my question, which is also has to do with the bigger picture. Without dealing with the bigger picture and the ambition of Iran in the bigger picture, uh, whether Washington and Tehran will really see eye to eye about a certain solution is uh, almost impossible, Mr. Nadari. Briefly, sir. Of course. I think there are sound minds in Iran and Washington and one day they will realize that all this circus was a silly, silly, silly mistake or misunderstanding and they didn't have to go that far in order to destabilize the whole world. So mm. there are sound minds and they welcome dialogue between these two countries but as you just mentioned it will take some time. But I don't okay. see any war between these two countries. Yeah. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. O'Hanlon, very briefly from you as well. One minute if you can, sir. Well, I think that my esteemed colleagues in uh, Iran and Beijing are, are saying smart things. However, we have to understand the Trump administration. They are not going to lift economic sanctions first to create a nice opportunity or atmosphere for negotiation. They consider the economic sanctions to be by far their most powerful form of leverage against Iran, and they would only consider lifting those sanctions once there is an explicit agreement by Iran on both the nuclear file and the regional violence file. So it's just not going to happen that we somehow ease the sanctions to get a negotiation right. started. It's going to be more the other way around. The sanctions are lifted once there is progress and change in Iranian behavior. That's just the way the Trump administration thinks. All right. While you were talking, Mr. O'Hanlon, I could hear very clearly long sighs coming from the other two guests. But for now, thank you so much, the three of you, for joining us and providing your insights from your own perspective. Uh, Michael O'Hanlon, Gambar Nadari, and Joe Rong, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing, still to come on the program. The pursuit of beauty in costume and set design. Oscar-winning art director of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Kim Yip, shares his keys to success and what the Chinese culture has brought to him. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live on CGTN from Beijing. The curtain fell on the 22nd Shanghai International Film Festival on Monday with productions from home and abroad bagging accolades. 
Global diversity in films submitted increased this year to a total of 1,875 films from 53 countries and regions. This year's theme was dedicated to the creative minds who bring enchanting adventures to global audiences. Films depict all aspects of culture, and these filmmakers open their hearts to depict their own stories from their own countries on the screen. The Academy Award-winning art director Tim Yep is surely one of them. He is best known for his works on the martial art film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, in which he won the 2001 Academy Award for Best Art Direction and certainly some of the other awards around the world as well. In his earlier works, Yep introduced the concept of New Orientalism, where he encourages a global audience to appreciate the beauty of Chinese culture. Earlier, at an exhibition in Beijing called the Tim Yep Mirror, he explained to me how he uses Chinese culture as a foundation of his artistry. I think Andy is really interesting because when uh, we work together in Counting Tiger Hidden Dragon, and one day uh, we we shooting is about how Yu Jiao Rong to slow run the Qingming Jian. After that experience, I feel we are the same person. Because uh, at the time when we, when we talk about how to shoot the shot, and then they, the, uh, the photographer and, and, the, and the master art, master, master art, and then they, they bring it together to, to see, because they are from Hong Kong. Yes. They say, you know, the, the camera is just like one. They just open the window, take out the window, and and falling in and then get the, uh, and get the story. As they usually do. Uh. But uh, I stopped them mm -hmm. and I say, because at that time they don't have this kind of window. The window has to be closed all the time. Only, win only window open is the upper window because in the Beijing they have a uh, stand, yeah. too many stand and wind, uh, so that they do it this way. And then they feel really angry. They say, you, you don't know movie. Movie have to fast. Have to but because they are more elder than me a lot, so I... Uh, and at that time, I, I sit there. I sit down. I don't compromise. <laughs> and and they feel really difficult. And they, they all wondering, I, tomorrow I, we are not coming. The kind of thing. And then uh, I sit down. And Annie come, come to me and ask me, is it real? Is it the, the building is like that? Is it a real historical building like that? I mean that this is palace. Palace is, must be have the rules of the building. We, we pay more many attention on how to build a set. We cannot do something wrong. Right? <laughs> and then the next day, I, I, come to, I come to the set, and I find that uh, they're shooting in, in the late morning, late afternoon. They, they separate in the three, three angles. And you generally is jumping up until the window and come down, until the window and come up. Is it difficult to find someone like you who really cares? I think almost <laughs> not that much, yeah. And also with Shao Hong, a female mm. uh, director for you know, TV series yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Shao Hong is, is really crazy too. She's like a military general, is it? And sometimes, he, she believes in something that more than me. It's like, I think, oh, this has to go back a little bit, but she's just running straight to it. So we just, we will keep the really good friendship. Yeah, yeah. But you have been expanding your mm. area. Yeah. You so much experimented mm -hmm. as this exhibition has beautifully yeah. demonstrated. I'm doing in America, I'm doing work in um, Europe. I, I try to learn how they're doing things. I give you an example. Uh, I work with Akon Khan. The last work is we do, we're doing the ballet Giselle. I develop a wall. I'm showing my work. There's a wall for ring like this, and everybody loves it. Just only one is the technical people. 
Ten little people feel nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> they always feel nightmare when they're working with you. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, all the people, the artistic director, everyone yeah, loves everyone it. Everyone loves it. Just love it. And then um, I know that they have some problem, really difficult because it's expensive, because of the, the safety, you know, many issue. And I and I try to be there all the meeting, to talk to the technical people, and they say, oh, this one say cannot do it. The render say cannot do it, but I will ask another render to come, <laughs> and make sure that they will do it. But Akram also makes sure they they will do it, so that everyone is the same heart. You are on the same page. Yeah, and then when when I coming back one day, Akram sent me a video. I f I feel so moving because I see the the role. <laughs> they do it. They just make it. And I, I find really, te really terrible happy. And, and then when I come back to see the rehearsal, it's amazing. It's amazing. I can see the lights in your eyes when you're still recounting it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one after another work, you cooperate with the others. Yes. But it's for them. Yeah. Uh, so how would you balance that? The role of accommodating yes. and the role of creation? For me, it's more easy because I have a really open heart. Yes. I, I, I try to be a Chinese, a good Chinese. A good Chinese never can. Well, what is a good Chinese? <laughs> I want to learn. <laughs> Tell me more about it. In Hong Kong, I have some good friends who are also really hiding. And then they work, they work everything. They don't get award, they don't, they don't do it. But, okay. but they can feel, but they can feel the beauty. They, mm. they, love, they love the beauty, yeah. that kind of beauty. You certainly always have something Chinese in a way, even mm -hmm. though it's very hard yeah, to yeah. say what Chinese means is. Yeah. I think that one of the artists that know Chinese, I guess, because I know the thing behind the simple. It's invisible force. Mm, if you, to a certain extent, you will disappear yourself. And then you just see the things and you don't see yourself. You don't see the shape. So that you can be anything. But you feel the essence of it. But you can be anything. You will go inside anything and you get out. You, you don't take anything away. What is beauty to you, Tim? I think it's the kind of Chinese elegant, right? The kind of elegant. Chinese elegant is different from uh, the West. Because the West is, is always, is you have to be educated if you want to be elegant. But Chinese, no, you have to be... Um, Mm. Demonstrate yourself. You have to practice yourself. Practice the peace in your mind and practice to speak. <laughs> you have to be fast and you have to be silent at the same time. So, how is it like for you? I mean, over the years, let's start from, mm -hmm. you know, your days with, uh, you know, TV dramas, uh, Oscar-winning uh, award movies. Uh, those were the very start, right? I think we are the, um, you know, the generation of, of movie actually. So we educate, we learn how to be a man, how to be, uh, you know, getting everything from movie. It's almost like that, you know, identity, everything from movie. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in the 60s, right? Every, everyone thinking about philosophy, meaning of life and everything. Um, so I, I think I was influenced by that period uh, of art in French, New Wave, a lot. So Fanini and Gauder and everyone. So uh, I, I'm still there, I think. I want to create something new, create the angles of seeing life and share the experiences. Mm -hmm. The most important thing of movie is to share the life experience. So um, I really hope people can, uh, you know, to share my work of happiness. And then, you know, it, it's not just happiness, it, it's something to to touch your heart and then make you feel strong. In one of the interviews you did earlier, maybe several years ago, you talk about today, there's such a lack of art mm -hmm. or artistic yeah. uh, that you want to bring it back. Yeah. Can we still find it back? Of course, I, I feel really positive. Because you are living in a spiritual world, but you you thinking you are living in a material world. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> Does the internet help, or the other way around? Mm, Technology. It's, it's not about it's not about the media itself. It's it's about the goals. It's about how how drive you to move. What is the tension? What is the motive? Why are you doing this? It, it's not about the media. It's about the content. We have to, but people is not that strong in energy. 
so that you, we have to, like artists, we have to doing something. It's like an art installation. You are creating your own little universe in a way. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder how much does that have to do with age, with growing, mm -hmm. mm. both as a man and as an artist. Yeah, I think it's give up. Give up is the way. When to you give, give up, up you, you, have to, you have to get away the weight so that you have the lightness, so that you, you can rise up and you see something different. <laughs> I think my attitude has never changed, uh, but I'm becoming more mature can be, you know, more easy to communicate, I mean. And, um, but, you know, some things are not changing. It's like Andy t talk about me after Oscar, and he feel me, I, I, I didn't change anything for my character. <laughs> it's always it's muddy and, you know, like, all the time concentrate on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I, I don't think I will change. Yeah. There's something there, that's never going to change. No, no, no. There, what is there's, it? There's, there's like an air surrounding so <laughs> And the electric start to be a problem. Mm. The computer always a problem. Mm. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> that's <crazy. that's> Tim. <laughs> yeah. Tim, I think I know you much better today. <laughs> and thank you for this effort you made yeah, 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 sure. to present to us different layers of you in order to find all of us. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. That's thank you I'm so doing. much, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tim Yip, the Oscar-winning artist. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. Good night.